Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today, I'm going to be telling you guys about a world record. Cece and I just got back from the Arctic, and while up there, we caught some incredible fish, and I was blessed to get an Arctic char that we've submitted for a line class world record. It was an incredible trip. We saw amazing sights, caught a bunch of record class fish. Check this out. Now, Tim, Cece, Tanya, and I have been very blessed to get a handful of world record fish over the years. And typically, we keep it really quiet. We don't want to talk about it ahead of time because the review process with the IGFA, the International Game Fish Association, it's a bit of a lengthy process and you really have to do it right. So you don't know, just catching a giant fish doesn't mean that you have a world record. You need to catch a giant fish properly and then document it properly in order to have a world record fish. So we typically don't say anything until we get that certificate back and we know that yes, we caught a world record fish and then we tell you guys about it either here or on Instagram or on Facebook. But recently the IGFA shared my char submission. So it's out there. So we thought, you know what, we'll take the opportunity to tell you guys an amazing story because some of you have been asking for a story video lately. I'm also gonna use that opportunity to tell you how incredible the Arctic is um, and to give you some advice about world records and to try and clear the air a little bit because it's not as complicated of a process as people think and there's so much bad information, especially in freshwater, especially in bass fishing. People have no idea how to get a world record. And it seems like every time that someone thinks they have one, there's some problem, but really it just comes down to doing it properly, documenting it properly. It's really simple if you plan ahead. So we're gonna talk about that too, but let's get over to the fish. So leading up to that fish is an incredible story. Um, Cece and I, finally got to go on a vacation, just the two of us. Sierra stayed with my parents and Cece and I flew up to the Arctic. We'd been saving for a long time to go on this trip. You guys know us as bass fishermen and that is what we are. That's our bread and butter. That's what we do. Uh, we live on one of the best bass fisheries in the country, but when we vacation, we just love fishing. It doesn't have to be bass. So Cece and I have both been completely infatuated with arctic char for a long time. If you've never seen a char lit up in spawning colors, they are one of the most incredible fish you will ever see. This beautiful silver fish comes out of the ocean into rivers and turns into this just fluorescent red creature that you just can't even believe is real. So both of us have just wanted to go to the arctic so bad and the opportunity finally came up. Our time finally came. It took forever just to book the trip because there's so few places to do it, so few places where the big ones are that they schedule out years in advance. We had to wait and wait to do this. So we finally get our chance. We fly up there and just that process is plane to plane to plane. You have to get all the way up across Canada and then ultimately you end up in a float plane headed up to the Arctic Ocean. And on the way there, we spent a few days on Great Bear Lake, which was incredible. I'm telling you about my Arctic char, but on this trip, Cece made six world record submissions. We'll come back to that another time. All that stuff is in review right now, but it was an amazing trip. It was incredible. Watching her catch giant fish was out of this world. The lake trout fishing was fabulous. Grayling fishing was incredible. That's one of my favorite species outside of bass. I love grayling. But after a few days, we got up to the actual Arctic Ocean. And the flight in was amazing. You're in a little float plane. We saw muskox, grizzlies, wolves. And then finally, you see the Arctic Ocean. And it just, it changes you. It's hard to explain. Being that remote, that distant, surrounded by just empty is, is almost mind-boggling. Uh, it really changes your perspective on everything. 
Then we come in in that float plane. We made a pass over the Tree River. That's where we were headed. That's where the biggest Arctic char in the world live. Did this pass over and you see that Tree River for the first time and you're just, you're ready. It's like you're headed to the Super Bowl, man. We come in and we actually landed on the river. Uh, it was amazing. Got into the lodge and a few things stood out to me right away. One, the Arctic was not as cold as I expected. Yes, I did a lot of my fishing in flip-flops. Uh, two, the fishery is tiny. It's a, it's a pretty good river. It's a pretty substantial river. It's like class three and four rapids. And then there's a huge waterfall and the char can't get over the waterfall. So the entire fishery is only like three miles long. It's a tiny little place in the middle of a giant place in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and then the biggest fish in the world come in there. But with all of the rapids, when we were there, it was booming. It was full blown flood stage. The water was super high. It was up in the brush uh, and it was dirty. And we were worried about catching a fish. Uh, but we finally got our chance. So we got out and we started fishing and it was a struggle. I'll tell you, when you go to a place like that, your entire goal should be to just catch a fish. And that was our goal. We had big plans. We went there hoping to get a world record class fish, but we also wanted to be realistic. So we brought everything, we were prepared, but goal number one was just land one, any one, because you've invested so much time and money and planning and everything else to get there. And your biggest fear is that you're not going to land one at all, because that is a real fear. There are not a ton of fish. They're incredibly smart. And most importantly, they're incredibly powerful. So you've got a fish that's hard to hold on to anyway in class three and four rapids. It is very easy to never land one. So we each had a goal. Cece needed to land one, I needed to land one. That was it. We would die happy. So that first day was a grind, but we finally got it done. Uh, and we caught some giants. It was incredible. Cece got the last one at almost 11 o'clock at night because when you're that far north, it just never really gets dark. There's a little tiny window in the early morning where it's kind of dark. But at 11, I mean, it's still bright, beautiful sun. When you're trying to sleep, it is bright. You've got adrenaline going from all the fishing that you've been doing. Uh, it's hard to sleep, but that first day was a huge success. And I'm going to circle back to that because there was a catch in there, a couple of catches that we really need to tell you about, but we'll go to the world record fish first and then backtrack because we actually caught some fish that were maybe more impressive than that world record fish. We'll circle back. So we finally got some sleep and on day two was when we re-geared and we said, okay, we've met our goals. We've each caught Arctic char. That first day I landed two, Cece landed three. It was incredible. Uh, I say day, it was the middle of the night by the time we'd caught them. But day two, our goals were done and we said, all right, let's take a real shot at trying to get a record fish here. And I knew that for me, the best shot that I had was eight pound line. So the eight pound line class was a fish that I thought maybe I could catch. So I geared up, I brought all the equipment with me. I had IGFA class line. All that means is you know that the line will break at or below eight pounds. Because the worst thing you could do is go buy eight pound line off the store shelf, spool it up, go catch a record fish, submit it, they do a break test, and you find out that that's like 13 or 14 pound line. Even though it says eight, that's not what it is. So if you're going to pursue a record, make sure that you know that the line that you've purchased will do what you need it to do. So we spooled up with all the proper line and we headed out. And that second morning was way tougher. The fish had definitely felt us the night before. They were really shut down, uh, but we finally got our shot. Cece, before we went, there's a Matt Allen swim bait head. She had tied a bunch of hair jigs for us, pink and white or chartreuse and white. And on that particular trip, because that water was so murky, they were all about that chartreuse and white. So she tied them in a Matt Allen swim bait head and she tied them in the smaller dirty jigs guppy head. 
So I put on, because I was throwing eight pound, I put on a guppy head. So I had a chartreuse and white hair jig built around a guppy head. And then on the back of it, a 4.8 Kitec. Chartreuse blue Kitec. Here we are up there in just the mecca of fly fishing. You know, when you get up into that part of the world, the people that are up there are ultra high end fly fishermen. That's the bulk of who's there. And they are very good anglers. They take it very seriously. They're on a world-class fishery. You don't get there by accident, right? It's a process. Uh, but we come in there and we're like, well, we're conventional guys. We, we bass fish. We're not the norm. And if you're a conventional guy, most of them throw spoons. This is a rocket devil. That's kind of what they throw up there if you're a conventional guy. We start throwing swim baits and you could just tell nobody thought we had a chance. But if there's one thing we know from traveling, not only bass fishing, but fishing for other species, a predator is a predator. Big fish eat little fish. Swim baits work. So that's what we were rigged up with. I started throwing that guy and that morning was tough. Like I said, we only got one bite and I got that bite. Now I was fishing an eight and a half foot Loomis a steelhead rod, an IMX steelhead rod. And then I had a Cronark on it. And then I had spooled it up with that eight pound mono. And eight pound is so tough with a fish of that caliber, but I got the bite. I'm fishing slow on the bottom. Just crawling bottom, I feel that. And I hit that fish, and you can imagine how hard I hit him with an eight and a half foot rod. It whack, hit that fish, and it just starts screaming drag. It took so much line, because they have the current working for them. Took so much line, did a big run, stopped, did another run, stopped, took another run, stopped. What you have to do when you're outclassed like that, because I knew going in with eight pound, we had a guide there. He was amazing. When we started that day, I said, Hey, I just want to let you know, I spooled up with light line and he's just shaking his head. And he said, did you put 12 pound on? And I said, you don't want to know. And we left it at that for a little bit. And he said, did, is it lighter than 12 pound? I just said, as I'm fighting the fish, he said, is it lighter than 12 pound? And I just said, you don't want to know. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, it's lighter than 12 pound. It's eight pound and it's a real eight pound. It's not, it doesn't just say eight pound. And this fish is just screaming. So when you've got a fish on like that and you know you're outclassed, the most important thing you can do, whether it's an Arctic char on the Arctic ocean, or it's a 12 pound bass in a grass bed, or it's a five pound smallmouth and you've got light line on, whatever it may be, the best thing that you can do is stay calm. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. But if you start getting crazy, start freaking out, that fish is as good as gone. So the whole thing is stay calm and just let it happen. So this fish would make these runs and all you could do is just let them go. There's brush out there, there's big logs out there, there's a bunch of boulders. There's nothing you can do about it. But what you can do is you can stay calm and you can lead them. So you treat those fish just like a salmon, especially with that long rod. Even if they're running, if you want them to go left, you lean hard left and just lay back on that rod. You don't want to pull on them. That makes them go crazy, but you just lean. And eventually they'll follow your leading. A bass is no different. If you hook a big bass in a dock and you want to get it out, don't try and drag him out. If you have heavy line, drag them out. If you have light line, don't go trying to drag them. You'll lose. All you do is just lean back and lead them. They'll dig and fight, but eventually they'll follow the course of that line once they start to calm down. So this char was digging and running and he'd go left, he'd go all the way across the river. And then he'd start digging back. You just turn that thing around and just lead him the other way. We got him all the way up to the bank three or four times and then he'd go all the way back across the river. Just stay calm, take your time, lean on them. And finally that fish came in and we got him. Uh, he ended up going 16.1 pounds. I told you in the beginning that we were prepared. So we already knew what we needed. We knew we had the right line. We know the rules. 
Nobody touches that line during the fight. There's some simple rules that you need to study so you know ahead of time. Don't make a mistake, just do it properly. We followed the rules, we got our fish. You need a couple of lengths, you need a girth, you need a weight. We got all that stuff, got all our ducks in a row. We got everything we needed, got our photos, and we got a clean release on that beautiful 16 pound male Arctic char. He was gorgeous. It was incredible. We're all high-fiving, but the difference between catching a big fish and going through all of that and catching a world record fish is preparation because you have to do it properly. See, the IGFA, the International Game Fish Association, it's their job to document records. Well, they can't have gray areas. It's cut and dry. You either follow all the steps and then they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that fish weighs what it weighs, it was caught ethically, procedure was followed, they know exactly what it weighs, they know exactly how long it is, all those things. They know that it was released properly, you have witnesses, it's all done right, and you have a world record. If you skip something, or you miss something, or you weren't prepared, you don't have a world record, because in record keeping, there cannot be doubt. That's the difference. So preparation is key. We had people comment after the IGFA shared it. I had people reach out. I had somebody tell me I was so lucky that there was actually a scale out there in the middle of the Arctic for me to get that fish. And then I had somebody else mad that I killed that fish in order to get a record. Both of those are silly things. We didn't kill that fish. We have never had a record fish die ever. We've been blessed, in the tactical family, we've been blessed with quite a few world records over the years because we were prepared. Uh, we've never lost one of those fish. You don't have to kill a fish to get a world record. That's nonsense. People say that every time a record comes up anywhere. People talk about what a shame is that it died. That doesn't happen. So check this out. You need a quality scale. This is the biggest thing. There wasn't some magical scale out in the middle of the Arctic. That's not a thing. We brought it with us. It's the same scale that we bass fish with. We tell you guys all the time, the Salter Brecknell is our favorite scale because it's so accurate that it's certifiable. You may not have known what that meant. What I meant by that is there are two scales on the market that I, I'm only speaking for myself, that I am confident that if I go out and catch a big fish and do everything right, and then afterwards I submit that scale with the world record application, they will certify a scale after the fact. It doesn't even have to be certified going in. They're going to check the accuracy. You just need a scale that will pass muster. If you submit some scale that you carry around in your bass boat that gets bumped everywhere and you catch a giant fish and you send them that scale and it's not accurate, that's no one's fault but your own. So there are two scales, the Salter Brecknell, the Electro Samson, and the Boga Grip are the two that I'm confident that if I go on a trip and I catch a, a record class fish, I know that afterwards when I send everything in, that that scale is going to get the stamp of approval, it's going to be certified as accurate, and then my record will proceed. So you can do it ahead of time, or you can do it after the fact. People don't realize that. So it's not random. There wasn't some magical scale out there. This thing was in my backpack with me all the way to the Arctic and it was ready when the time came and we got all our measurements and our weight. We got a clean release on a beautiful fish. It's still swimming. I'm sure it's back in the Arctic Ocean by now. And uh, then we send everything off and go through the process. It's really that easy. It's been certified after the fact. Now this one is certified for a year. So, backing up. That fish was incredible. The whole trip was incredible. Like I said, Cece got three and I got three. She caught some beautiful, beautiful char. Uh, and she worked so hard for him. That first day, it was already what should have been nighttime when she got that first one. And that is normal. It is so hard to land those fish. But once she got them fired up, three in a row, gorgeous char. So back to that other fish I was going to tell you about. That same evening that Cece caught her three, it was after dinner, 
the guides were all out just fun fishing. They were down fly fishing. And Cece and I went out and met up with them. We fished with two of them. And again, they're fly fishing. There's the conventional way to do this. I walk up and I tied on this setup right here. Matt Allen swim bait head, quarter ounce, river to sea, D Walker 120 in the PB red. This was the only fish that we caught that wasn't on chartreuse and blue was on this one right here. On my second cast, I got a bite that I will never forget until the day I die. Now, I've submitted that other fish, that 16 pounder, as the eight pound line class world record. This fish, we didn't submit for anything. Now that I'm home, I kind of regret it. Uh, it was by far the longest char by a lot. I mean, by like six, eight, nine inches. Um, it would have been the all tackle length record by a landslide. But once we got this fish, and I'll, I'm gonna back up here in a second, but once we got this fish, we were all in such awe. I had the gear with me. I had the scale, I had everything to tape it out, all the stuff in my backpack, on my back. And we got this fish and all we could think was, we need to get this fish back in the water. This is incredible. So, a second cast I got bit and I hit this fish and it started screaming like you just can't imagine, just taking a line. And I was throwing a Cronarch with 20 pound braid uh, and a 20 pound leader on top of it. So the heavy leader was just in case I started bumping on anything, you know, it took me around rocks or around brush or anything. The main line was light so that if it ran down river, you know, 20 pound braid is so paper thin. If it ran down river, I would have tons of line even on a Cronarch 150 that I could follow my fish. That was the logic there. So I get this fish on, it's screaming. It finally starts coming back, screams again, goes all the way across the river, around brush. You just take your time, just lean on them. You're using quality gear, you have to trust your gear, you have to trust yourself, and you just know that if you're patient, most fish will come back out. And it did, it came back out of the brush, back out into the river, fought it again. The first time this fish came up, it came right to my feet. I don't know how many times before we finally got it because it was too powerful. The first time it came in close, I said, oh my gosh, that's a salmon. And I didn't literally mean salmon. I just mean, it's huge. That's no trout. Uh, it, it was incredible. I just, I had, I know that the world record char is a 32 pounder from the tree river. I get it. But knowing that a 30 pound fish comes out of a place and being tied into a giant fish are not the same thing, right? We had just caught some char. I had just caught one that was probably 15 pounds a couple hours earlier. And it was incredible. When I saw this thing, it was like a dinosaur in the water. It tore me up. I was so grateful that I had it on my head, that I had it on a strong jig hook. I know my hook, I know what my hook can take. I was so grateful I had it on an eight and a half foot rod because this fish was making these huge head shakes and that rod would just eat those head shakes up for me. Having the right gear, being prepared, it's everything. One of the guides, when I went crazy, the first, you know, when I was just fighting it, they're strong, so they were still fishing. But when I saw it, and I screamed about how big it was. I mean, he dropped everything and started running because obviously this was a special fish. And he ended up tailing that fish for me. We didn't even have a net with us. We finally got that fish. We got it out of the water. We estimate this char at around 28 pounds. Absolute fish of a lifetime. Out of this world. I mean, it was so big. We don't know exactly what it weighed. I had everything on my back to go through the whole process with this fish. But when you're looking at a fish of that caliber, I'm holding this thing like this in my hand. I mean, it's that big trying to hold on to this tail section. All we could do was let it go. If that was, that was all any of us could think. There were, at that point, there were four of us around this fish. We got it out of the water, got the hook out, Cece grabbed a GoPro, shot the footage she could there were shadows on the fish it was like 
maybe 10 seconds total from walking away from the water, trying to get a picture to let's get this thing back in the water. And we turned that fish loose, gone. Now that I'm back home, a fish that big, I wish I knew exactly what it weighed. I mean, you're talking beyond fish of a lifetime, beyond world record, all tackle world record caliber fish. So blessed to ever interact with a fish like that. I mean, they just don't get that big. And to just walk up and make a couple of casts and stick that fish, and then to do it on stuff that, that we fish with at home. To catch it on my own head, to get a dirty jigs Matt Allen swim bait head. Mind boggling. You guys know how much I love the D-Walker. I caught it on a D-Walker. I caught it on a swim bait. Uh, mind blowing. We had the best trip in the Arctic. It was incredible. Uh, just an amazing time. Cece and I had a ball together. We caught a ton of giant fish. Like I said, there are some other submissions coming out of that trip. And uh, once those get approved, we'll tell you about it because Cece was on fire. It was, it was amazing such a good trip to such a remote part of this planet guys it takes preparation it's not random we weren't up there randomly it took years of preparation just to get there you know you have to save the money then you have to coordinate this whole thing get your gear right but then when you're there and it comes together i mean we got a world record submission out of there a world record arctic char and then another one that was just beyond real what a trip. Uh, we haven't done story videos for you for a long time, but we've had a lot of requests for it. And when the IGFA shared that char, we thought, you know what? This would be a good time to, to tell the story, to clear the air, to help people understand how to get a world record, uh, because you don't have to kill these fish. They're special fish, but you can do it properly. You can document them and you can get a clean release. And we wanted to tell you about that as well as about how amazing it was to be up there. If the opportunity ever presents itself, whether it's the Arctic or anywhere else, even if it's going to a lake four hours away you've never been to, if you can pull it off, you need to live life, have those experiences, try new things, go new places. That's what it's all about. The most amazing thing about tactical bass and taking off in the last few years is that Tim and I and our families now have a little bit more freedom than we had before to go and to do and to see new places and we get to take you guys along and we don't take that lightly. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I went really long, but I wanted to do those fish justice. I wish you could have been there. I wish we had run cameras the entire time and had it all documented for you so you really could be there. But on the other hand, if we had done all of that, it wouldn't have been special in the moment. And this was a special trip. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. We'll talk to you soon.